let's begin with the classic paradigm, uh, which is throughout the Industrial Revolution, which has been cited by theorists from Marx to Kropotkin to Proudhon to yourself, that um, you build a consciousness among workers within the manufacturing class, and um, uh, eventually you lead to a kind of autonomous position where workers can control their own production. We now live in a system, a globalized system, where most of the working class in industrial countries like the United States are service workers. We have reverted to a Dickinsonian system where those who actually produced live in conditions that begin to replicate almost slave labor. And I think, as you have written in places like southern China, in fact, are slave. What's the new paradigm for resistance? Um, you know, how do we learn from the old and, and confront the new? Well, I think the uh I think we can draw many uh, very good lessons from the uh, early period of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, of course, earlier in England, but let's take here the United States. The Industrial Revolution uh, took off right around here, eastern Massachusetts, mid-19th century. Uh, this was a, a period when uh, independent farmers were being driven into the industrial system. Uh, men and women, incidentally, women from the farms, so-called factory girls, and uh, they bitterly resented it. They had a, it was a period of a very free press, the most in the in the history of the country. There was a, a wide variety of journals, uh, the ethnic labor, others, and when you read them, they're pretty fascinating. The uh, people driven into the industrial system. Uh, regarded it as an attack on their personal dignity, on their rights as human beings. They were free human beings who were being forced into what they called wage slavery, uh, which they regarded as not very different from chattel slavery. In fact, this was such a popular view that it was actually a slogan of the Republican Party, uh, that the, the only difference between working for a wage and being a slave is that working for a wage is supposedly temporary. Uh, pretty soon you'll be free. Other than that, they're not different. And uh, they uh, bitterly resented the fact that the, in, the, the industrial system was even taking away their uh, rich uh, cultural life. And the cultural life was rich. Uh, there are by now studies of uh, the British working class and uh, the American working class. and. Uh, they were part of uh, the high culture of the day. Actually, I remember this as late as the 1930s with my own family, industry, you know, sort of unemployed working class. And they said, this, we're, this is being taken away from us. Uh, we're being forced to be something like slaves. They argued that if, you, if you're, a, 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 say, a journeyman, a craftsman, and you sell your product, uh, you're selling uh, your, what you produced. If you're, a wage, if you're a wage earner, you're selling yourself, which is deeply offensive. Uh, they condemned what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. Sounds familiar. And uh, uh, it, it was extremely radical. Uh, it was combined with uh, a, uh, the most uh, radical democratic m movement in American history, the populist the early populist movement, uh, radical farmers, that began in Texas, spread into the Midwest, the enormous movement of farmers who uh, wanted to free themselves from the domination by the, the Northeastern bankers and capitalists, kind of ran the markets, you know, uh, sort of forced them to uh, sell their, uh, what, what they produced on credit and squeeze them with credit and so on. Uh, they went on to develop their own uh, banks, their own cooperatives. They started to link up with the Knights of Labor, major labor movement, uh, which held that, as they put it, those, those who work in the mills ought to own them. That should be a democrat, free democratic society. These were very powerful movements. Uh, by the 1890s, uh, 
you know, workers were taking over uh, towns and running them in eastern Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania, Homestead was a famous case. Well, they were crushed by force. Uh, it took some time. Uh, sort of the final blow was uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, Red Scare right after the First World War, which virtually crushed the labor movement. Uh, at the same time, in the early 19th century, uh, the, uh, the business world recognized, both in England and the United States, that sufficient freedom had been won so that they could no longer control people just by violence. They had to turn to new means of control. The obvious ones were control of opinions and attitudes. Now that's the origins of the massive public relations industry, which is explicitly dedicated to controlling minds and attitudes. The first government, partly was government, the first government commission was the British uh, Ministry of Information. This is long before Orwell. He didn't have to invent it. Uh, so the Ministry of Information had as its goal to control the, th the minds of the people of the world, but particularly the minds of American intellectuals for a very good reason. They knew that if they could delude American intellectuals into supporting British policy, they could be very effective in imposing that on the population of the United States. The British, of course, were desperate to get the Americans into the war. It was a pacifist population. Uh, Woodrow Wilson won the 1960, 16 election with the slogan, uh, peace without victory. And they had to drive a pacifist population into uh, a population that bitterly hated all things German, wanted to tear the Germans apart. Uh, the Boston Symphony Orchestra couldn't play Beethoven. You know, and they succeeded. Uh, the Wilson set up a, a counterpart to the uh, Ministry of Information. It's called the Committee on Public Information. You know, again, you can guess what it was. And uh, they at least felt that, probably correctly, that they had succeeded in uh, carrying out this massive change of opinion on the part of the population and driving the, pacif the pacifist population into, you know, warmongering fanatics. And the people on the commission learned a lesson. One of them was Edward Bernays, who went on to found the, the main guru of the public relations industry. Another one was Walter Lippmann, who was the leading progressive intellectual of the 20th century. And they both had to drew the same lessons and said so. The lessons were that uh, we can, we have it, what Lippmann called a new art in democracy, manufacturing consent. That's where Ed Herman and I took the phrase from. For Bernays, it was engineering of consent. Uh, the conception was that the intelligent minority, who of course is us, uh, have to make sure that we can run the affairs of public affairs, affairs of state, the economy, and so on. Uh, we're the only ones capable of doing it, of course. And we have to be, I'm quoting, free from the roar and the trampling of the bewildered herd, the uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, the general public. Uh, they, have to, they, have a, they have a role. Their role is to be spectators, not participants. And every couple of years, they're permitted to choose among one of the responsible men, us. Uh, and uh, that, uh, the John Dewey circle uh, took the same view. Uh, uh, Dewey changed his mind a couple of years later to his credit. But at that time, Dewey and his circle were writing that, uh, speaking of the First World War, that this is the first war in history uh, that was not uh, organized and manipulated by the military and the political figures and so on, but rather it was carefully planned by rational calculation of the intelligent men in the community, namely us, and we thought it through carefully and decided that uh, uh, this is the reasonable thing to do for all kind of benevolent reasons. And they were very proud of themselves. If There were people who disagreed, like Randolph Bourne, disagreed. He was kicked out. Uh, he couldn't write in the Deweyite journals. He wasn't killed, you know, but he was just excluded. And uh, if you take a look around the world, it was pretty much the same. 
uh, in the uh, the intellectuals on all sides were passionately dedicated to the uh, national cause, all sides, Germans, British, everywhere. There were a few a fringe of dissenters, like Bertrand Russell, who was in jail, uh, Karl Lieb Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg in jail, uh, Randolph Bourne uh, marginalized, Eugene Debs in jail for daring to question the magnificence of the war. In fact, Wilson hated him with such passion that uh, when he finally declared an amnesty, uh, Debs was left out and had to wait for Warren Harding to uh, release him. And he was, he was the leading labor figure in the country. He was a you know, candidate for president, Socialist Party, and so on. Uh, but th the lesson that came out is you c we believe you, you can and, of course, ought to control the public. And if we can't do it by force, we'll do it by manufacturing consent, by engineering of consent. Out of that comes the huge public relations industry, massive industry dedicated to this. Incidentally, it's also dedicated to undermining markets, a fact that's rarely noticed, but it's quite obvious. Uh, business hates markets. They don't want them. And you can see it very clearly. Uh, markets, if you take an economics course, are based on uh, rational, uh, informed consumers making rational choices. You turn on the television set and look at the first ad you see. It's trying to create uninformed consumers making irrational choices. That's the whole point of the uh, huge advertising industry. But also to try to control and manipulate thought. And it takes various forms in different institutions. Media do it one way, the uh, academic institutions do it another way. And uh, the, the educational system is a crucial part of it. It's not a new observation. Uh, there's actually an interesting essay by Orwell's, which is not very well known because it w wasn't published. It's the introduction to animal form. Uh, in the introduction, he addresses himself to the people of England. And he says, uh, you shouldn't feel too self-righteous reading this uh, satire of the totalitarian enemy because in free England ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. And he doesn't say much about it. He actually has two sentences. Uh, he says uh, the press, one reason is the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason not to want certain ideas to be expressed. But the second reason, the more important one in my view, is a good education. He said, if you've gone to all the good schools, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on, uh, you have instilled into you the understanding that there are certain things it wouldn't do to say. And I don't think he went far enough. Wouldn't do to think. And uh, that's very broad among the educated classes. That's why overwhelmingly they tend to support state power and state violence, and maybe with some qualifications like, uh, say, Obama is regarded as a critic of the invasion of Iraq. Why? Because he thought it was a strategic blunder. That puts him on the same moral level as some uh, Nazi general who thought that the Second Front was a strategic blunder. He should knock off England first. That's called criticism. Uh, but uh, And sometimes it's kind of outlandish. Uh, for example, there were there was just a review in the New York Times book review of uh, Glenn Greenwood's new book by Michael Kinsley, in which bitterly condemned him as a mostly character assassination, didn't say anything substantive. But Kinsley did say that it's ridiculous to think that there's any repression in the media in the United States because we can write quite freely and criticize anything. And he can, but then you have to look at what he says. And that's quite interesting. Uh, Michael Kins in the 1980s, when the major domestic local news story was the U.S. massive U.S. atrocities in Central America, they were horrendous. I mean, it wasn't presented that way, but that's what was happening. Kinsley was the voice of the left on television, and there were interesting incidents. At one point, the U.S. Southern Command, uh, which ran over sea you know, was the overseer of these actions, uh, gave instructions to the uh, uh, terrorist force that they were running in uh, Nicaragua called the Contras. 
and they were a terrorist force. They gave them orders to, they said, not to duke it out with the Sandinistas, meaning avoid the Sandinista, the Nicaraguan army, and attack undefended uh, targets like agricultural cooperatives and you know, health clinics and so on. And they could do it because they were the first guerrillas in history to have uh, high level uh, 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 communications equipment, you know, computers and so on. The US CIA just ran, uh, controlled the air totally uh, so they could send instructions to the terrorist forces telling them how to avoid the Nicaraguan army detachments and attack uh, undefended uh, civilian targets. Well, this was mentioned, you know, it wasn't publicized, but it was mentioned. And uh, America's Watch, which later became part of Human Rights Watch, was uh, made some protests. And Michael Kinsley responded. Uh, he condemned America's Watch for their emotionalism. He said, we have to recognize that we have to accept the, a pragmatic criterion. Uh, we have to ask uh, for something like this. He said, we have to compare the amount of blood and misery poured in with the uh, uh, success of the outcome in producing democracy, what we'll call democracy. And if it meets the pragmatic criterion, then terrorist attacks against civilian targets are perfectly legitimate, which is not a surprising view in his case. He was the editor of the New Republic. Uh, the New Republic, supposedly liberal journal, uh, was arguing that uh, uh, we should support Latin American fascists uh, because they're more important things uh, than human rights in El Salvador, where they were murdering tens of thousands of people. That's the liberals. And yeah, they can get in the media, no problem. Uh, and it's and, and they're praised for it, regarded with praise. Uh, all of this is part of the uh, massive system of, you know, it's not that anybody sits at the top and plans at all, it's just exactly as Orwell said, it's instilled into you. It's part of a deep indoctrination system which leads to a certain way of looking at the world and looking at authority which says, yes, we have to be subordinate to authority. We have to believe we're very independent and free and proud of it. Uh, as long as we keep within the limits, we are. Try to go beyond those limits, you're out. But that, that, that system, of course, is constant. But what's changed is that we don't produce anything anymore. So what we define as our working class is a service sector class working in places like Walmart. Um, and the effective forms of resistance, the sit-down strikes, um, uh, you know, the, the going back even further in the middle of the 19th century with the women in Lowell, uh, I think that was a wa the Wobblies were behind uh, those textile strikes. What are the mechanisms now, and I know you have written, as many uh, anarchists have done, about the importance of the working class controlling the means of production, taking control, and you, you, are, you have a great quote about how you know, Lenin and the Bolsheviks are right-wing right deviants, I think, was that, which is, of course, exactly right, because it was centralized control destroying the Soviets. Given the fact that production has moved to places like Bangladesh or southern China, what is going to be the paradigm now? And given, as you point out, the uh, powerful forces of propaganda, and you touched upon now the security and surveillance state, we are the most monitored, watched, photographed, eavesdropped population in human history, and you cannot even use the word liberty when you eviscerate privacy, that's what totalitarian is, what is the road we take now, given the paradigm that we have, which is somewhat different from you know, what this country was, certainly in the first half of, of, of the 20th century? I think it's pretty much the same, frankly. The idea still should be that of the Knights of Labor. Those who work in the mills should own them. And there's plenty of manufacturing going on in the country, and probably there will be more as uh, for unpleasant reasons. Uh, one thing that's happening right now, which is quite interesting, is that energy prices are going down in the United States because of the massive uh, exploitation of 
fossil fuels, which is going to destroy our grandchildren, but uh, under the uh, you know, capitalist morality, uh, uh, the, the calculus is that profits tomorrow outweigh the existence of your grandchildren. That's uh, institutionally based. So yes, we're getting lower energy prices. And if you look at the business press, they're uh, you know, very enthusiastic about the fact that we can undercut manufacturing in Europe uh, because we'll have lower energy prices and therefore it'll, manufacturing will come back here and we could even undermine European efforts at developing sustainable energy because we'll be so much, uh, we'll have this advantage. Uh, Britain is saying the same thing. Uh, Britain, I was just in England recently as I left the airport. I read uh, the Daily Telegraph, you know, I mean, newspaper, big headline. Uh, England is going to begin uh, frack fracking all over the country, uh, even fracking under pe people's homes without their permission. And that'll, make, that'll allow us to destroy the environment even more quickly and uh, we'll, have, we'll bring manufacturing back here. Uh, same is true w with Asia. Uh, manufacturing is moving back to an extent to Mexico and even here as uh, uh, wages increase in China, partly because of labor struggles. It's, there's massive labor struggles in China, huge all over the place. And uh, since we're integrated with them, we can be supportive of them. But manufacturing is coming back here and both manufacturing and the service industries can move towards uh, having those who do the work uh, take over the management and ownership and control. In fact, it's happening uh, in the old Rust Belt, you know, Indiana, Ohio, and so on. There's a significant, not huge, but significant uh, growth of uh, worker-owned enterprises. They're not huge, but they're substantial around Cleveland and other places. Uh, the background is interesting. Uh, in uh, 1977, uh, U.S. Steel, big, you know, multinational, uh, decided to close down uh, their mills in uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, Youngstown is a steel town, sort of built by the steel workers and the main, one of the main steel producing areas. Well, the union uh, tried to buy the plants from uh, U.S. Steel. They objected, in my view, mostly on class lines. They might have even profited from it. But the idea of worker-owned industry is, doesn't have much appeal to uh, uh, corporate leaders, which means bankers and so on. Uh, so it went to the courts. Uh, finally, the union lost in the courts. But with enough popular support, they could have won. Well, they, the working class just and the community did not give up. Uh, they couldn't get the steel mills, but they began to develop small worker-owned enterprises. Uh, They've now spread throughout the region. They're substantial. And it can happen more and more. And the same can happen in Walmart. Um, there's a massive uh, efforts right now, significant ones, to organize uh, the service workers, what they call associates, in, uh, in the um, service industries. And these industries, uh, remember, depend very heavily on uh, a taxpayer largesse uh, in all kinds of ways. I mean, for example, let's take, say, Walmart. They import uh, goods produced in China, which are brought here on container ships, uh, which were d designed and developed by the U.S. Navy. And point after point where you look, you find that the way the system, uh, the system that we now have is one which is radically anti-capitalist, radically so. I mean, I mentioned one thing. the. Uh, powerful effort to try to undermine markets uh, for consumers. But there's something much more striking. I mean, under, in, the, in a capitalist system, the basic principle is that, say, if you invest in something, and say it's a risky investment, so you put money into it for a long time, maybe decades, and finally, after a long time, something comes out that's marketable for a profit, it's supposed to go back to you. That's not the way it works here. It takes, say, uh, uh, computers, uh, internet, uh, lasers, microelectronics, uh, 
containers, uh, GPS, uh, in fact, the whole IT revolution. Uh, there was taxpayer investment in that for decades, literally decades, doing all the hard, creative, risky work. Does the taxpayer get any of the profit? None, uh, because that's not the way our system works. It's radically anti-capitalist, just it's radically anti-democratic, opposed to markets, in favor of concentrating wealth and power. But that doesn't have to be accepted by the population. These are all, there are all kinds of forms of resistance to this can be developed if people become aware of it. Well, you could argue that in the election of 2008 with Obama, it wasn't accepted by the population. But what we see repeatedly is that once elected officials achieve power uh, through, of course, corporate financing, uh, the consent of the governed is a, a kind of cruel joke. It doesn't poll after poll. I mean, I sued Obama over the National Defense Authorization Act in which you were a co-plaintiff, and the polling was 97% against this section of the NDAA. And yet the courts, which have become wholly owned subsidiaries of the corporate state, the elected officials, the executive branch, and the press, which ignored, largely ignored it, the only organ that responsibly covered the case was, ironically, the New York Times. Um, we don't have, it doesn't matter what we want. It doesn't, I mean, we, and I think, you know, that, that's the question. How do we affect change when we have reached a point where we can no longer appeal to the traditional liberal institutions that, as Karl Popper said, once made incremental or piecemeal reform possible to adjust the system of course, to save capitalism, but now it can't even adjust the system. You know, we see well, uh, cutting wel uh, welfare. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's perfectly tr true that the population is mostly disenfranchised. In fact, that's a leading theme even of academic political science. You take a look at the mainstream political science. Uh, so, for example, a recent paper that was just published out of Princeton by uh, Martin Gilland and Benjamin Page, two of the leading analysts of these topics. What they point out is uh, uh, they went through a couple of thousand policy decisions and found what has long been known, that there was almost no, that, that the pub public attitudes had almost no effect. Uh, uh, public organiza organizations that are sort of nonprofit organizations that are publicly based, no effect. Uh, the outcomes were determined by uh, a concentrated private power. There's a long record of that going way back. Uh, Thomas Ferguson, a political scientist near here, has shown very convincingly that uh, something as simple as campaign spending is a very good predictor of policy. That goes back into the late 19th century, that's right through the New Deal, you know, right up till the present. And that's only one element of it. And uh, you take a look at the literature, you know, about 70% of the population uh, what they believe has no effect on policy at all. You get a little more influence as you go up. When you get to the top, which is probably like a tenth of one percent, they basically uh, write the legislation. I mean, you see this all over. I mean, take these huge uh, trade so-called trade agreements that are being negotiated, Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic, enormous agreements, kind of NAFTA-style agreements. Uh, they're secret, almost. They're not secret from the hundreds of corporate lawyers and lobbyists who are writing them. They know about it, which means that their bosses know about it. And uh, the Obama administration and the press says, look, this has to be secret, otherwise we can't defend our interests. No. Yeah, our interests means the interests of the corporate lawyers and lobbyists who are writing the legislation. Take it a few pieces have been leaked and you see that's exactly what it is. And same with the others. But it doesn't mean you have to accept it. And there have been changes. So take, say, take, say the new, in the 1920s, the labor movement had been practically destroyed. Uh, there's a famous book, one of the leading labor historians, David Montgomery, has a major book called something like The Fall of the House of Labor. He's talking about the 1920s. It was done. There had been a very militant labor movement, very effective. Farmers' movement as well, crushed. In the 1920s, almost nothing left. Well, the 1930s, it changed. And it changed because of popular activism. 
but it also changed because of the breakdown of capitalism. There was a circumstance that led the, to the opportunity to do something, but we're living with that constantly. I mean, take the last 30 years. Uh, for the majority of the population, it's been stagnation or worse. Uh, that's a permanent, it's not exactly the deep depression, but it's a kind of a permanent semi-depression for most of the population. That's a pl there's plenty of uh, kindling out there which can be lighted. And uh, what happened in the 30s is uh, primarily CIO organizing, the militant actions like sit-down strikes. Sit-down strikes is very frightening. It's a step before taking over the institution and saying, we don't need the bosses. And uh, that there was a cooperative administration, Roosevelt administration, so there was some interaction and uh, significant legislation was passed, not uh, you know, not radical, but significant, can't, can't underestimate it. And that, no, uh, it happened again in the 60s, it can happen again today. So I don't, I don't think that one should abandon hope in chipping away at the more oppressive aspects of the society within the electoral system, but it's only going to happen if there's massive popular organization which doesn't have to stop at that. It can also be building the institutions of the future within the present society. Would you say that the you spoke about propaganda earlier and the Creole Commission and uh, the rise of the public relations industry, the, the capacity to disseminate propaganda is something that uh, now you, you virtually can't escape it. I mean, it's there in some electronic form, even in a handheld device. Uh, does that make that propaganda more effective? Well, you know, it's kind of an interesting question. Uh, I've, like a lot of people, I've written a lot about uh, media and uh, intellectual propaganda. But there's another question which isn't studied much. How effective is it? And that's kind of, it's, when you brought up the polls, it's a striking illustration. The propaganda is, you can see from the poll results that the propaganda has only limited effectiveness. I mean, it can drive a, a population into terror and fear and war hysteria like before the uh, Iraq invasion or 1917 and so on. But over time, the public attitudes remain quite different. In fact, studies even of what's called the right wing, you know, people who say, uh, get the government off my back, that kind of sector, they turn out to be kind of social democratic. Uh, they want more spending on health, uh, more spending on education, more spending on, say, uh, uh, women with dependent children, but not welfare. No spending on welfare because Reagan, who was an extreme racist, succeeded in demonizing the notion of welfare. So in people's minds, welfare means a, a rich black woman uh, driving in her limousine to the welfare office to steal your money. Well, nobody wants that, but they want what welfare does. Uh, foreign aid is an interesting case. There's an enormous propaganda against foreign aid, so because we're giving away everything to the undeserving people out there. Uh, you take a look at public attitudes. A lot of opposition to public foreign aid, very high. On the other hand, when you ask people how much do we give in foreign aid, way beyond what we give. When you ask what we should give in foreign aid, far above what we give. And this runs across the board. Uh, take, say, taxes. Uh, there have been studies of attitudes towards taxes for 40 years. Overwhelmingly, the population says uh, taxes are much too low for the rich in the corporate sector. We've got to raise them. Uh, what happens? Well, the opposite. Well, it's just exactly as Orwell said. It's instilled into you. It's part of a deep indoctrination system which leads to a certain way of looking at the world and looking at authority, which says, yes, we have to be subordinate to authority. We have to believe we're very independent and free and proud of it. Uh, as long as we keep within the limits, we are. Try to go beyond those limits, you're out.
Well, what was fascinating about, I mean, the point this, to, to buttress this point, when you took the major issues of the Occupy movement, they were a majoritarian movement. Um, what, when you look back on the Occupy movement, what do you think its failings were, its importance were? Well, I think it's a little misleading to call it a movement. Mm -hmm. Occupy was a tactic, in fact, a brilliant tactic. I mean, if I'd been asked in, you know, a couple months earlier whether they should take over, uh, uh, you know, public places, I'd have said it's crazy. But it worked extremely well, yeah. and it lit a spark, which went all over the place. Hundreds of, uh, hundreds of places in the country there were Occupy events. It was all over the world. Uh, I mean, I gave talks in Sydney, Australia, to the Occupy movement there. But it was a tactic, very effective tactic, changed public disc public discourse, not policy. It uh, brought issues to the forefront. I think my own feeling is its most important contribution was just to break through the atomization of the society. I mean, it's a very atomized society. There's all sorts of effort to efforts to uh, separate people from one another, to so as if the ideal social unit is, you know, you and your TV. You know, Hannah Arendt raises atomization as one of the key components of totality. Exactly. And the Occupy actions broke that down for a large part of the population. Uh, people could recognize that we can get together and do things for ourselves. That uh, we can have a common kitchen. We can have a place for public discourse. That uh, we can form our ideas and do something. Now, if those attitudes, that, that's an important attack on the core of the means by which the public is controlled. So you're not just uh, uh, an individual trying to maximize your consumption, but there are other concerns in life and you can do something about them. If those attitudes can be, and associations and bonds can be sustained and move in other directions, that'll be important. But going back to Occupy, it's a tactic. Uh, tactics have a kind of a half-life. You can't keep doing them. And certainly you can't keep occupying public places for very long. Uh, so, and it was very successful, but the, it was not in itself a movement. The question is, what happens to the people who are involved in it? Do they go on and uh, develop? Uh, uh, do they move into communities, pick up community issues? Uh, uh, do they uh, organize uh, thing? Uh, let's take, say, this business of, say, worker-owned uh, industry. Uh, right here in Massachusetts, not far from here, there was uh, in a, uh, 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 something similar. One of the multinationals decided to close down a, a fairly profitable small plant which was uh, producing uh, aerospace uh, equipment, high-skilled workers and so on. But it wasn't profitable enough, so they were going to close it down. The union wanted to buy it company refused, usual class reasons, I think. If the Occupy uh, efforts had been uh, available at the time, they could have provided the public support for it. Now, this happened when uh, Obama virtually nationalized the auto industry. Uh, uh, there were choices. The one, one choice, was what he took, of course, was to uh, uh, rescue it. Uh, return it to essentially the same owners, uh, different faces, but the same class basis, and send them back to doing what they had been doing in the past, uh, producing automobiles. There were other choices. And if the, something like the Occupy movement had been around and sufficient, could have driven the government into other choices, like, for example, turning the uh, uh, auto plants over to the working class and have them produce what the country needs. And we, we don't need more cars. We need mass public transportation. Um, what, the United States is an absolute scandal in this regard. Uh, I just came back from Europe, so you can see it dramatically. You get on a European train you, where you want to go in no time. Now, the train from Boston to New York is maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes faster than when I took it 60 years ago. It's, uh, you go along the Connecticut Turnpike and the trucks are going faster than the train. Uh, recently, in Japan, uh, 
offered the United States a low interest loan to build high speed rail from uh, Washington to uh, New York. It was turned down, of course, but what they were offering was to build the kind of train that I took in Japan 50 years ago. And this is a scan this was a scandal all over the country. Well, you know, a reconstituted uh, uh, auto industry could have turned in that direction under worker and community control. I don't think these things are out of sight. And uh, incidentally, they even have so-called conservative support because they're, you know, they are within, like, a, they're, they're within a broader uh, capitalist, kind of what's called capitalist framework. It's not really capitalist, and uh, uh, and those are directions that should be pressed. Uh, right now, for example, the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, steelworkers union is trying to establish some kind of relations with uh, Mondragon, the huge uh, worker-owned conglomerate in the Basque country in Spain, which is very successful, in fact, and very you know, includes uh, industry, manufacturing, banks, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, living quarters. It's very broad. If that, it's it's not impossible that that can be brought here. And it's, it's potentially radical. It's creating the basis for quite a different society. And I think with things like, say, Occupy, the timing wasn't quite right. But if, they, if the timing had been a little better, and this goes on all the time, so it's always possible, it could have provided a kind of an impetus to move significant parts of the socioeconomic system in a different direction. And once those things begin to take off, and people can see the advantages of them, can become quite significant. Uh, there are kind of islands like that around the country. So take Chattanooga, Tennessee. It happens to have a publicly uh, organized uh, internet system. It's by far the best in the country. The rapid uh, internet access for broad parts of the population. I suspect the roots of it probably go back to the TVA and the New Deal uh, uh, initiatives. Well, that can, you know, if that can spread throughout the country, uh, why not? It's very efficient, very cheap, uh, works very well. It could undermine the, uh, the telecommunications industry and its oligopoly, which would be a very good thing. There are lots of possibilities. I want to ask just two last questions. First, the fact that we have become a militarized society, something the anti, all of the predictions of the Anti-Imperialist League at the end of the 19th century, including Carnegie and Jane Addams, hard to think of them both in the same room. Um, uh, but you go back and read what they wrote and they were right. Um, what, how uh, a militarized society has deformed us economically, Seymour Melman wrote about this quite well, and politically. Um, and that is a hurdle that as we attempt to reform or reconfigure our society, we have to cope with. And I wondered if you could address this military monstrosity that you have written about quite a bit. Well, for one thing, the public doesn't like it. What's called isolationism, or one or another bad word, is uh, you know, pacifism, what's, is just the public recognition that there's something deeply wrong with our dedication to uh, a military force all over the world. Now, of course, on, at the same time, the public is frightened into believing that we have to defend ourselves. And it's not entirely false. A part of the military system is generating forces which will be harmful to us. Uh, say, Obama's terrorist campaign, the drone campaign, the biggest terrorist campaign in history. It's generating potential terrorists faster than it's killing suspects. You can see it. It's very striking what's happening right now in Iraq. Yeah. And on the, the truth of the matter is, is very evident. You see, could go back to the Nuremberg Judgment. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But in Nuremberg, uh, aggression was defined as the supreme international crime differing from other war crimes in that it includes, it encompasses all of the evil that follows. 
Well, U.S.-British invasion of Iraq is a textbook case of aggression. By the standards of Nuremberg, it all be hanged. Uh, and it, 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 one of the things it did, one of the crimes, was to uh, ignite a Sunni-Shiite conflict, which hadn't been going on. I mean, there's you know various kinds of tensions, but Iraqis didn't believe there could ever be a conflict. They were intermarried, they lived in the same places, and so on. But the invasion set it off, took off on its own. By now it's inflaming the whole region. Uh, now we're at the point where uh, uh, Sunni jihadi forces are actually marching on Baghdad. And the Iraqi army is collapsing. Iraqi, the Iraqi army is just giving away their arm. Right. There obviously is a lot of collaboration going on. Uh, and all of this is a U.S. crime. A U.S. crime if we believe in the validity of the judgment against the Nazis. And it's kind of interesting. Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor, U.S. Justice, at the tribunal, addressed the tribunal, and he pointed out, as he put it, that we are giving these defendants a poison chalice. And if we ever sip from it, we have to be treated the same way, or else the whole thing is a farce. And we should recognize this is just victory. But, it, but, it, but it's not accidental that our security and surveillance apparatus is militarized. Uh, and, and, and you're right, of course, that there is no uh, broad popular support for this expanding military adventurism. And yet, it's, the question is if there is a serious effort to curtail their power and their budgets. Um, they have mechanisms, and we even heard Nancy Pelosi echo this in terms of how they play dirty. I mean, they have inform they are monitoring all of the elected officials as well. Along with monitoring, them. but despite everything, it's still a pretty free society, and the recognition by U.S. and British business back a hundred years ago that they can no longer control the population by violence is correct. And control by, of attitude and opinion is pretty fragile, as is surveillance. It's very different than sending in the stormtroopers. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of latitude for people of relative privilege, at least, uh, to do all sorts of things. I mean, it's different if you're a black kid in the ghetto. Yeah, then you're subjected to state violence. But for a large part of the population, there's plenty of opportunities which have not been available in the past. But the, but the, the, the majority, or those people are essentially passive, virtually. And but Hannah, they don't have to be. They don't have to be, but Hannah Arendt, when she writes about the omnipotent policing that were directed against the stateless, including herself and France, said the problem with building omnipotent policing, which we have done in our marginal neighborhoods, and targeted people of color who can have their doors kicked in and stopped at random and thrown in jail for decades for crimes they didn't commit, is that when you have a societal uh, upheaval, you already have both a legal and a physical mechanism by which that omnipotent policing can be quickly inflicted on the residents. I don't, I don't think that's true here. Uh, I think the time has passed when that can be done for increasing parts of the population, those who have almost any degree of privilege. The state may want to do it, but they don't have the power to do it. They can carry out extensive surveillance, monitoring. Uh, they can be violent in, against uh, parts of the population that can't defend themselves, uh, undocumented uh, immigrants, uh, uh, black kids in the ghetto, and so on. But even that's, that it can be undercut. For example, a lot of the, uh, I mean, one of the major scandals in the United States since Reagan is the huge incarceration program, uh, which is a, a weapon against, it, it's, it's a race war, uh, but it's based on drugs. And there is finally cutting away at the source of this in the criminalization and the, the radical distortion of the way the criminalization of uh, drug use has worked. That can have an effect. I mean, I think, you're, look, there's no doubt that the, 
the population is passive. There are lots of ways of keeping them passive. There's lots of ways of marginalizing and atomizing them. But that's different from stormtroopers. It's quite different. And it can be overcome, has been overcome in the past. And I think there are lots of, potent of initiatives, some of them being undertaken, uh, others developing, which can be used to break down this system. I think it's a very fragile system, including the military. Let's just close with climate change. You, like I, read climate change reports, which... Well, unfortunately, that may doom us all, and not in the long distance future. That just overwhelms everything. That is the first time in human history when uh, we, not only we have the capacity to destroy the uh, conditions for decent survival, and it's already happening. I mean, just take a look at species destruction. Uh, species destruction now is estimated to be at about the level of 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit the Earth and ended the, you know, the period of the dinosaurs, wiped out huge numbers of species. Same level today, and we're the asteroid. And uh, if and you take a look at what's happening in the world, I don't know if anybody looking at this from outer space, they'd be astonished. I mean, there are sectors of the global population that are trying to impede the catastrophe. There are other sectors that are trying to accelerate it. And you take a look at who they are. Those who are trying to impede it are the ones we call backward. Uh, indigenous populations, the First Nations in Canada, you know, uh, Aboriginals in Australia, tribal people in India, you know, all over the world are trying to impede it. Who's accelerating it? The most privileged, uh, advanced, uh, so-called advanced, uh, uh, educated uh, uh, populations in the world, the U.S. and Canada, right in the lead. And uh, we know why. They're also uh, and the, it's, here, here's an interesting case of manufacture of consent, and does it work? You take a look at international polls on global warming. Americans are, who are the most propagandized on this. I mean, there's huge propaganda efforts to make you believe it's not happening. They're a little below the norm, but so there's some effect of the propaganda. It's stratified. If you take a look at Republicans, they're way below the norm. But what's happening in the Republican Party all, along, all across the spectrum is very striking. So for example, about uh, two thirds of Republicans believe that there were weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq uh, that, uh, and the, uh, all sorts of other things. You know. So, so it's, it's stratified, but, there, but there's some impact of the propaganda but not overwhelming. Most of the population still regards it as a serious problem. Uh, that, uh, th there's actually an interesting article about this in the Columbia Journalism Review, which just appeared, current issue, uh, you know, the lead critical review of journalism. They attribute this to um, what they call the doctrine of fairness in the media. Doctrine of fairness says that uh, if you have an opinion piece by uh, 95, 97% of the scientists, you have to pair it with an opinion piece by the energy uh, uh, corporations, because that'd be fair and balanced. There isn't any such doctrine. Like if you have a, a, an opinion piece uh, denouncing uh, Putin as the new Hitler for annexing uh, Crimea, you don't have to balance it with an opinion piece saying that a hundred years ago, the United States took over southeastern Cuba at the point of a gun and is still holding it, uh, though it has absolutely no justification other than to uh, try to undermine Cuban development. Whereas in contrast, whatever you think of Putin, there's reasons. You don't have to have that. Um, you have to have fair and balanced when it affects the concerns of private power, period. But try to get in article in the Columbia Journalism Review pointing that out, although it's transparent. So all these things are there, but they can be overcome, and they'd better be. Unless, this isn't, you know, unless there's a sharp reversal in policy, unless we here in the advanced, so-called advanced societies can gain the consciousness 
of the indigenous people of the world, we're in deep trouble. Our grandchildren are going to suffer from it. And I think you would agree that's not going to come from the power elite. Certainly. It's up to us. Absolutely. And it's urgent.